I am very conscious of how much I've squeezed people into some very small time slots. It does reflect quite how much is happening in the uh, sharing of data and quite what the options are. And I'm, I've, I've got to admit that having not been able to get our first speaker to turn up one time when he was at 10 Downing Street, I did manage to get two neutron stars to bump into each other 1.3 billion years ago, just so that it was announced last week as a, as a setup for our last speaker, Roberta, who's going to talk to us about statistics in the above and beyond. And, and hopefully it's kept you around and you'll be around for the wine afterwards. Thank you. Thank Roberta. you, Tim. Thank you very much. And thank you for the kind invitation to speak to this wonderful group. This is going to be a little different. Um, I'm going to take you a little bit of a tour of the universe, but then I'll try at the end to bring you back down to Earth and see how the kind of things that we do in outer space really can be of relevance for some of the very interesting things that, that you are interested in doing with data and data analytics. So a little tour starts in the uh, 1500s or so, where in, here is a, a, a model for the known universe at that time, showing quite clearly that we were at the center of the universe around Earth, spun the, uh, you know, the sun, the moon, the other uh, traditionally known classic planets, and all around us, the fixed stars, marking the end of uh, the cosmology as it was known then. Since then, our knowledge of the universe has expanded quite quickly since uh, essentially the Galilean and Copernican revolution in the uh, 1700s. And when we established that we actually we're not at the center of the universe, we are one of a series of nine or eight planets, depending on how you count, when you consider Pluto to be a planet, revolving around the sun. And we're just one among many such planets. And of course, as our knowledge of the universe expanded, so, is, so our position in that universe has uh, constantly diminished. And we now understand that the sun itself is but one about 300 billion stars or so that make, out, make up our galaxy, the Milky Way, which itself is but one, one tiny little piece of a much grander cosmic tapestry of stars and galaxies. And in fact, to give you a sense for how um, meaninglessly small we are in that vastness of the cosmos, I want you to focus on this little uh, yellow square in this picture. And I put the moon there to scale because everybody's kind of familiar with how the moon appears in the sky. So this hopefully gives you a sense that this yellow square is really, really, really tiny. In fact, it's so small that it would fit inside the eye of a needle held at arm's length. And at first sight, it doesn't look anything remarkable, but if you zoom in with the most powerful telescope we currently have, the Hubble Space Telescope, this is what you see. Each one of the dots on this picture is a galaxy, just like the Milky Way, and each one of those galaxies contains a few hundred billion stars, and there are about 5,500 galaxies in that eye of the needle. So you do the maths, uh, in, if you multiply for, for, by the surface of the sky, there are about 50 billion galaxies in the visible universe alone. And uh, the fact is that we now have new window on this uh, incredible universe. And uh, as Tim was mentioning, we, you've all heard about this magnificent discovery uh, just the other day, so it set us up quite nicely. Chances are you haven't heard uh, about it from Swiss National TV, because if you had, then you know, this improbable guy uh, <laughs> was talking, you know, this guy is somebody who looks like me, but he's like 10 years younger, um, 10 kilos fatter, and he works at some improbable place called Empire College London. I don't know exactly <laughs> where that is, but anyhow. <laughs> and as Tim, as Tim mentioned, what, what this is doing is opening up a new data collection window of the universe by using gravitational waves for the first time to listen in to things like in spiraling neutron stars in this case, and most importantly, in terms of aggregating data, by correlating this kind of data with data from very different uh, sources, the electromagnetic spectrum in this case, uh, uh, and high energy photons from satellites in orbit uh, to the Earth, we can do in incredible things. For example, we can establish that gravity does indeed propagate out at the speed of light, just like Einstein's theory uh, predicted. And we can establish that uh, certain properties of gravity are indeed uh, precisely of the kind that Einstein predicted 100 years ago. And so by cross-correlating data effectively, we are opening up incredible new windows on our understanding of the universe. But, unfortunately, there is some news, and the news are not good, which is that 96% of the universe is actually missing. Everything I've talked about, all the stars, the galaxies that I mentioned, are but a tiny little bit of the total. And so, if you haven't heard it before, unfortunately, I'm, I'm sorry to have to break the news that 96% of the universe is dark. It doesn't even show up 
in the maps that I showed you before in the pictures, because it's made of components that are presently unknown, not very well understood even theoretically, and invisible to any of the telescopes that we have. And together, these two other components of the universe, dark matter, dark energy, make up 96% of the universe. So everything we saw in this Hubble Space Telescope picture before is but 4% of the total. And so there's a wealth of other discoveries awaiting. And in fact, the picture that we've assembled in the last 50 years of cosmology is one of a universe that starts with what we call a Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago, when time starts, and then undergoes a period of exponential uh, expansion called inflation, uh, in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds, and then starts decelerating uh, under the influence of radiation and then dark matter. But then, surprisingly, about six billion years ago, the expansion of the universe stops slowing down under the influence of gravity and instead picks up speed under the influence of something that we don't understand and that we call dark energy. And from a data point of view, what's astonishing is that we've been able to chart out the expansion of the history, uh, the expansion history of the universe all the way back here, almost at the very beginning, where the light emitted by the Big Bang itself has been released, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And this, uh, this is such a map of that light that comes really from the uh, physical end of the visible universe. And by analyzing statistically the uh, data contained in this map, we've been able to establish that indeed the universe has got a dark side. There's 96% of the universe that's, that's missing. But don't take my word for it. Uh, I'll show you the data in a minute. And the thing is that the way we've been working on this data has been very much powered by something we call astrostatistics. And what is astrostatistics? Here's a sort of a summary of what astrostatistics is, is pretty much what it says on the tin is astronomers working with statisticians. And of course, there is a little bit of translation to be done here because astronomers have their own lingo and statisticians have their own lingo. So first of all, we need to sit down together and understand each other. But once we start doing so, then we can really develop powerful new methods for uh, uh, statistically analyze a wealth of astronomical and astrophysical data to solve problems in astrophysics and cosmology. And those problems go from the observation of light from the Big Bang itself, those explosions of distant stars called supernovae, to the distribution of galaxies in the sky, simulation of the dark matter distribution in the universe. And eventually what it boils down to is quantitative analysis of those data to learn the value of quantities that are of interest to physicists because they describe essentially the makeup of the universe. And one, I just want to highlight one of the quantities that we've been able to learn using astrostatistics, which is the age of the universe. 13 billion, 796 million years old, give or take, 29 million years, which is nothing. 29 million years uncertainty is nothing at all. You know, we are we're sitting on Earth here, and we, we know roughly the Earth is 5 billion years old. We don't know the age of the Earth to that level of accuracy. And we sit on it, that we've been able to establish the age of the universe with a 0.3% accuracy. It's simply phenomenal. And, and how have we been, have we been uh, doing this? Well, it turns out that physicists have a, a long uh, illustrious tradition at, at being good at statistics, indeed in driving statistics. If you go back to the 1800s and, and 1900s, you will see that lots of the things that we now think of as statistics have actually been initiated and invented by astronomers or mathematicians looking at astronomy problems, trying to solve problems in astrometry, in astronomy or astrophysics, uh, which didn't have a solution at the time and for which statistical tools did not exist. More recently, in, in, in the second half of the 20th century, many computational methods that are now very common in, in all uh, data analysis fields have been uh, developed by physicists, again, in looking for solutions to problems that didn't have any solution to the time. What's interesting to note from a historical point of view is that there is a gap here between sort of the 1900s and then the late 20th century where astronomers sort of sat back and let uh, biologists and, and, and geologists like Fisher and, and, and all the founding fathers of classical statistics take the helm of statistics and, and take it down the path of defining p-values and all the rest of all the things that we know of, of as classical statistics. What were astronomers then doing in, at the turn of the 20th century, which is in many, in many sense a golden age of classical statistics? Well, astronomers were busy in trying to figure out our place in the universe. Here is uh, Edwin Hubble, who in 1927 or so uh, did something quite extraordinary. And uh, he measured the velocity at which 
And distant nebulae, which at the time were known as anything else but sort of fluffy things that you could barely see on the sky. We now know those are distant galaxies. So it measured the velocity at which those galaxies were moving away from us, and it measured the distance uh, uh, from, 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 uh, from us, and collected a number of data points, and then did something that hardly needed any big data analysis capability, or indeed inferential statistics. It's something quite bold. It drew a straight line through this cloud of points, <laughs> linear regression. <laughs> And it said that the velocity of those objects was proportional to the distance, and proportionality constant is known to this date as Hubble constant. These data were not quite as good as you would like. He estimated this constant to be 500 in whatever units. And we now know it to be 72. So it was a little bit off. Uh, but nevertheless, it got the idea right. And this discovery was quite momentous because it was one of the foundational stones of what we now call uh, modern cosmology. Because what this data implies is that the universe is expanding in such a way that the distant objects are expanding from us faster than the nearby ones according to this uh, relationship. Which means, conceptually, if you think about it in the kitchen, it means that the universe is just like a focaccia bread rising in the kitchen. And the universe is expanding, and so you've got galaxies, that's to say olives, on the focaccia here. That's our universe expanding over time. Our galaxy is here, the Milky Way, and all the galaxies are around it. And as time goes by, you can see that gal all galaxies move away from us, and the distant galaxies move away further, and therefore the velocity is larger, exactly like Hubble saw. And what is more, by using this very simple model that you can all bake in your kitchen, uh, if you look at it from the point of view of another galaxy, you see that all of the galaxies around that other galaxy also move away from that galaxy. So the fact that we see galaxies flying away from us does not mean that we are the center of the universe. Everybody sees the same in an expanding universe, and so we really are not at the center of the universe, and, and what we see is typical of any observers. And you can understand it using a simple you know, focaccia bread in your kitchen, and you put it in the oven 180 degrees for 20 minutes. You bake it, you eat it, and you've got a wonderful time. But let's fast forward to the modern day, because nowadays, using sophisticated uh, telescopes and, um, and, and whole sky survey, we've been able to extend Hubble's measurements to much bigger distances. Indeed, you see Hubble was down here. And what we see is that Hubble's relation holds true to much, much higher distances with more sophisticated measurements and, and better data. Not only that, we've been able, as I mentioned, to map back the origins of the universe all the way to essentially the primordial fireball, uh, whose temperature was measured for the first time in 1965 by these uh, two gentlemen, um, Penzias and Wilson, at, uh, uh, in New Jersey at Bell's lab, using this microwave horn antenna, essentially a, a telescope that picks up uh, light of the same frequency as the microwaves that cook your food in your microwave oven. And what they established in 1965 is that the temperature of that uh, leftover radiation from the Big Bang was 3 Kelvin, so that's minus 269 degrees centigrade. So the, the primordial fireball, as it expanded, cooled down, and it cooled down to within three degrees of absolute zero. So that's how cold outer space is. That got the Nobel Prize for its discovery uh, because essentially they established the universe started in a hot Big Bang and that it had a beginning, that time had a beginning. Much more recently, we've been able to measure the distribution of energy in that, uh, in that relic radiation. You can see here the, uh, the data. And for those of you to whom one sigma means anything, those are not one sigma error bars, those are 400 sigma error bars. And that's the black body prediction from, from essentially Planck, Planck temperatures, black body spectrum. So that's a prediction and for that temperature, and those are the data. You couldn't build such a precise black body distribution in the lab. It doesn't exist. You can't get it so precise. The universe effectively was a hot oven 13.7 billion years ago, and this is the remnant of that, of that uh, initial uh, temperature of the, of the universe. Another Nobel Prize for Physics in, uh, in uh, half of the Nobel Prize for Physics in the early 2000s. But there's more. We've been able to map out the distribution of temperature from the Big Bang in great detail, and I'm going to show you how our knowledge of that um, a very um, refined temperature distribution has evolved over time. 1994, the first detection of tiny temperature differences in the light coming from the Big Bang, one part in 100,000, very difficult to measure experimentally. 2004, 2015, you can see it's the same data, but now look, looked at with better and better and more refined instruments. And you can see tiny little red spots, which are slightly hotter regions, 
and tiny blue spots, which are cooler regions in the sky, and the red spots are regions that are hotter, denser, therefore uh, gravity will attract matter around those regions. That's, those are essentially the seeds out of which gravity uh, built the galaxies that we see in the sky. So in other words, you're seeing here the seeds out of which all of the structure in the universe grew over time. Without this map, we wouldn't be here to talk about it today because there wouldn't be any galaxies, any stars, and the universe would just be a boring, dead place. What is beautiful about this is that we can put a picture together like this from the early universe, but we can analyze it statistically. And that is where astrostatistics comes in. And I don't want to go to the details of this diagram, but just say that the blue error bars, the blue points are, with error bars are data. So there are error bars on these data points. You can't see them. They are so small. And the red line is a cosmological model fit coming from physics with only six free parameters, including the dark matter and dark energy unknown quantities that I've described, including Einstein general relativity, and all the theoretical thinking that we've been able to put together. And you can see the fit is amazing. You can see it goes bang through the points. There's a structure to these points. There's clearly an oscillation which we understand based on physics. And so the point is that we clearly have come to a point where cosmology is able to reconstruct, predict, and fit data from light that's traveled 13.7 billion years through the universe using very sophisticated statistical and, and data analytical tools. Indeed, in a sense, astronomy, astrophysics is the original big data science. And here is a, a, a map that puts together uh, all that we know about the universe today. So here is distance from us on a logarithmic scale. So each tick here is one order of magnitude more distance. Here is one of the two angles on the sky. Of course, we've got two different angles that describe the position of the sky. I'm just showing one. So this map shows you things that we, we know about here, satellites in low Earth orbit, geostationary satellites, the moon, Venus, Mercury, the sun. This band here uh, is the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, and then the outer planets here. Voyager 1 is here. That's the furthest object that humanity has sent into space. Sent in, uh, launched in 1978. Where is it? Well, you know, in the cosmic neighborhood, just uh, reaching now the end of the solar system. But of course, cosmology stretches much further up. If we go up, here we could find nothing, nothing, nothing for three orders of magnitude. And then here, Milky Way stars, of which the red dots are stars where we've discovered exoplanets. That's to say, planets that go around other stars than, uh, uh, than the sun. At the end of the Milky Way, we got galaxies, and each dot here is now a galaxy, each one of which contains about 300 billion stars. And so that really is the domain of cosmology. That is the big data space that uh, I want you to consider. And because everybody's got to have a map, here is mine. <laughs> and frankly, I think that's pretty hard to beat. That's a map, sorry. That's a map of the entire universe. Everything we know about the universe condensed in one graph. Okay, so from satellites and debris, all the way to the most distant quasars ever observed. And you can see the difference from an analogous version produced in 20, 2005 to today. You can see at every scale the explosion of big data. And so this map and the, the statistical tools that go with it, I think, are quite remarkable, especially for this group uh, of people uh, in many ways, because those data are big, certainly. Yes, they are. But equally, they are expensive but worthless in many, in many cases. In other words, those are data that are very expensive. Each one of those data sets cost 10 to the 9, a billion pounds, dollars, euros, whatever. But they're all public. There is, there is no commercial sensitivities around those data. So they're all publicly available. And indeed, many of the, fund, well, all of the fund, major funding agencies that put the money in for acquiring those data require those data to be published and released to the public domain for everybody to analyze, which means that we can, every, all the community of cosmologists and astrophysicists can and does develop detailed physical models for the analysis of this data. And it's a synergy that allows us to use our best tools to unlock uh, the universe's secrets from uh, those data that are available to everybody. So we have sophisticated measurement modeling. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the thing is that we have very uh, sophisticated tools because those, those data are expensive. Cosmology is observational science. We can't reproduce the universe at will in a lab, except in simulation. And therefore, we need to be very careful about how we analyze those data and to squeeze out all of the information that we possibly can. And so 
big data in the universe, of course, the number of atoms in the visible universe is of the order of 10 to the 80. So there's lots of data out there. But uh, as we all know, even this kind of domain in big data has been dwarfed in recent years by the rise of social media. The number of possible tweets is far, far bigger than the number of atoms in the universe, about 10 to 198, and that, that, the number does not include emojis. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, so somebody said that uh, if you take a monkey and you give the monkey a keyboard and, and give them enough time, they will randomly uh, produce uh, Shakespeare's sonnets, which is true, and the, the, my, uh, the, this, number, this is also included in this number here, although most of those tweets are gibberish, but that shouldn't count, given that most of the, uh, the President of the United States tweets are gibberish anyhow, so that doesn't really matter. From a mythological point of view, the incredible increase in the number of astronomical object discoveries, which has been driven since the early 90s by CCD cameras and digital technology, just like uh, the big data in, in, in the public domain has been driven by the fact that we all carry uh, these big uh, data producing machines in our pockets nowadays. And the same is true in astronomy. But what's interesting is that from a mythological point of view, the number of papers that use a, 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 a flavor of statistics called Bayesian probability um, has also increased exponentially in the last years. And the reason is that these kind of more advanced methods and computationally and both uh, statistically and in terms of uh, um, thinking about data are really necessary to, to be able to deal with this deluge of data. And so there are a number of problems, I won't go through any of them except to give you an example in a moment, that where Bayesian astrostatistics, as to say the kind of tools that we develop to analyze this data and, 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 and derive the kind of physical understanding that I described, are really problems that, although we, well, we encounter them in, in the context of cosmology, are really uh, common to a, a lot of data-driven problems in the wider society. Sampling of large parameter space, hundreds of thousands of parameters at the same time, things like Markov chain Monte Carlo, machine learning, of course, uh, supervised classification, time series analysis, forecast, optimization, uh, hierarchical models, and so on and so forth. So there's many, many tools that we've developed to analyze our own big data, which are portable, and indeed the methodology is very much similar in, in, in very applied domains in society. And so, and, and I, come, I come back to the point that I was making at the beginning after taking you on this very quick sort of crash course of cosmology in the 21st century, uh, the unsuspected connection is that many of these ideas are applicable to some of the problems that you may be interested in, uh, in solving. I'll give you, to conclude, an example of application of these kind of uh, tools. A problem that is uh, very concrete, a problem that I worked on as a, as a uh, consultant with a young startup company called Utonomy. And Utonomy are looking at an important problem for the gas distribution network, namely the fact that uh, gas leakage is costing the industry a great deal of money, both in terms of leakage of gas, unnecessarily leaking out of the distribution network, 300 billion megawatt hours per year, that's to say 16 billion pounds of gas that simply vanishes through leakage. But also, from a, an environmental perspective, methane gas is four times as bad as CO2 in terms of greenhouse effect. And therefore, this gas is, is, is also contributing to uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And indeed, uh, various government schemes are, that are trying to reduce the greenhouse effects are going to penalize um, co gas distribution companies for, for such a leakage. So really, that's an important problem from a commercial point of view, and it's an important problem from an environmental point of view. And so, Utonomy is looking at this problem, recently funded, to try and solve this problem using a number of engineering, but also statistical problems. And that's work that I've done with Imperial College of London Consultants, which is a consultancy arm of Imperial, and uh, my own company, Data Fusion Consultants. And here, in a nutshell, is what happens when, when you have uh, these uh, gas pipes, which uh, are distributed at medium pressure here, and then there are governors uh, in, in, in each neighborhood that reduce the pressure from a medium pressure to a low pressure so that it can be distributed to the, uh, to the, uh, um, to the uh, local network. And uh, the thing is that, of course, in, the, in summer, wherever well, the, the temperature is, well, I wouldn't say hot in this country, is hotter, perhaps, <laughs> than in winter. When temperature is OK, nobody, the gas demand goes down. But in winter, when at 6 o'clock in the morning, when temperature is freezing and everybody uh, gets their central heating on, the, the demand goes up. 
And so the current business model, way, the way uh, the companies deal with this problem is physically sending around people with vans four times a year, adjusting the governor valve here, so that the, the pressure reduction uh, matches the, uh, roughly what is the average demand at, at that point in the season. But uh, the, if you look at it more, in more detail, the reality is that demand varies both across the year and it varies across the time of the day. And so at moments, say, 6 o'clock in the morning and, and, and 5, 6 p.m., when everybody turns central heating on to get hot water, then the demand increases and therefore the pressure in the network goes down as demand goes up and then the pressure goes back up. And so what people do currently, gas companies do, they keep the pressure very, very high up here so that they can meet the, the peak demand here. Otherwise, uh, the pressure drops too much and then it drops below a threshold, at which point your, gas, your, your, your boiler stops working because there isn't enough pressure in the system. But there is a lot of wasted pressure here. So if you could follow with your governors the demand much more closely, then you would be able to, to reduce the, uh, the average pressure in the network, reduce leakage, save gas, save money, and save the world at the same time, if I want to borrow this. Uh, this, this platitude from Silicon Valley. And so the idea is that if we can match the pressure to the, to, the, to the curve of the demand, then we can reduce the minimum pressure to just about the minimum which is demanded from a, uh, from a regulatory framework and, and achieve uh, all of that. So the uh, so Audio Autonomy's work has been focusing on um, engineering solutions for how to uh, remotely control the governor pressure rather than sending out people in vans with, with, with spanners. But the statistical problem is that this, this uh, adjustment cannot be done dynamically for power constraints and all, all, other, all sorts of reasons. And therefore, a statistical prediction mechanism is needed to be able to predict demand locally based on uh, historical data uh, over a period of 24 hours. And then every 24 hours, the system would update from a centrally driven um, um, computer to the next prediction for the next set of 24 hours. And so the, st the statistical task was to see whether we could improve performance by applying some of the tools and techniques that we've been developing for cosmology. So really, from cosmology to customers. And here is a, a prototype solution that I've developed for autonomy, just to give you a sense for what this does. This is time. Um, in, uh, of the day, and this is the uh, data, the historical data. This is the pressure measured uh, uh, at, a, at a certain evaluation point. And you can see it goes up and down. It does all sorts of dirty, nasty things. And so what uh, the statistical model does, it learns the behavior of the pressure as a function of time up to this point. So we train the, 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 the network up to this point. And then from this point onwards, we let the prediction system lose and we give the, the, the system the ability to predict what's going to happen. And so the forecast is the black dots, and the actual measured points, just for comparison, are the blue dots. You can see the forecast is pretty good. We're able to predict in pretty good detail what the uh, behavior is going to be in the next 24 hours, and we can adjust the uh, uh, pressure in such a way that the new pressure, the pressure that's actually measured, is no longer this, but it's this. It's much smoother and it's much closer to the statutory minimum down here. So this means achieving a 5 to 8% pr uh, pressure reduction just by using clever statistics, which translates in several hundred million pounds if you were able to roll out the system across the UK, just this relatively simple prototype would uh, uh, immediately save uh, hundreds of millions of pounds across, across the UK network. So that's but one example of, of the unsuspected links sometimes between uh, what is out there and what it's down here. So in conclusion, just wanted to summarize uh, the, the, our, our, the, big, um, the big journey that, has, that humankind really has gone through in terms of our understanding of the universe. Uh, 1800 uh, BC, uh, the, the early astronomers, uh, among them Egyptians, for example, recorded events of notice in the sky on, on, on clay tablets. Uh, this is uh, from 1610. That's the discovery of Saturn's, uh, um, of Jupiter's moons by Galileo and uh, his beautiful drawings. And since then, uh, we've been able now to do incredible things. For example, imaging, di direct imaging of planets going around other stars, which you see here, not to mention the gravitational waves discovery that we have already, uh, we have already discussed in passing. And, in, and going in forwards in the 2020s, it's clearly the case that humans will no longer even be able to visually inspect those data. There's simply too much data out there 
for us to even just be able to look at them. And so any new discovery, just like the gravitational wave discovery shows, will rely on sophisticated statistical methods to analyze, interpret the data, and characterize any physical model uh, uh, behind them. And so astrostatistics becomes really our most, most powerful eye onto the universe, and also, I try to argue, an invaluable business tool by translating very advanced methods that have been developed at the, at the, at the, at the call phase of big data research uh, into real-world data-driven problems. Thank you very much. I don't know if anybody wants to take a little bit of time to ask a question. Is it? Yeah, oh, I, I, just say, I just say this, I want to apologize for not being able to stick around for yeah, the reception no, because I need to go pick up my son in 29 minutes or be thrown out of nursery. <laughs> if yeah. anybody's got any questions, please feel free to Thank feel you. free, please. I've got one that really intrigued me, and that was so, some of us have been looking at how to use smart metering data, mm -hmm. which sounds quite connected yeah. with, with the stuff. That, the, what you were doing wasn't smart metering data, no. was it? No, this is, this is based purely on, on uh, historical pressure measurement data. But of course, if you could predict demand, mm. then you'd be, you'd, you'd be really in a great advantage. Because what this does, it uses pressure measurements and temper, uh, temperature measurements as a proxy for demand. Mm. But if you had smart metering data into mm. the picture, that would give mm. you a shortcut into what is demand actually like, and can we yeah, predict yeah. that? And that's a much easier proxy. Yeah. It would be a very good thing to have. Cool, cool. I don't want to keep your son waiting. That would not be fair. Uh, so if anybody, nobody else has got any, any questions, we'll, we'll say thank you to all three speakers for really stretching the bounds of showing where data can do from helping some really deprived families in really hopefully helpful ways and quite dramatically changing the process, really showing us ways to share data that Barclays are really leading the way on and, and then uh, stretching our minds in various different directions. Thank you very much, all three.